Welcome to Aquarian Diary, where we discuss issues around the emerging age of Aquarius. I'm your host, John Irving. Thank you for joining me. Greetings all, it is August 31st, 2022. I just had a realization that to me is significant. Now, this isn't a spiritual realization. It's more of a societal realization. Or consider it a fairly well-informed theory, informed by both intuition and a lot of reading. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some things that are going on in Canada currently, but bear with me because this is relevant to the United States and probably everywhere. As I've said before, I do quite a bit of reading because I really like to be informed, and I'm extremely curious and interested in what's happening in the world and why. And part of my reading routine is to check Canadian media sites just to see what's happening and if there's any major developments or whatever. Now, a couple of the things that have been prominent recently are increasingly journalists, and in particular journalists who are not Caucasian, or who do not appear to be Anglo-Saxon, and particularly those who are female, are receiving more and more violent threats and intimidation in emails and other forms of communication. You know, sometimes they will even point out that they know where they live and stuff like that. And so the journalism community in Canada has been really alarmed by this, and there have been increasing calls for something to be done about it. So that right there is kind of alarming because that's not typically what happens in Canada. We're generally a peaceful country and when we get along and we're, we tend to be very accepting of, you know, immigrants and uh, different cultural groups and everything. We're, we're like one of the best places in the world for that, actually. So this trend is alarming and disturbing and you're kind of scratching your head going like, well, where is this coming from? Also... The person who looks like they're going to be leading the Conservative Party, which is the opposition party to the Liberals, his name is Pierre Poliev. Our current Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, head of the Liberal Party, just recently won a federal election, gaining another four-year term. The person who's running for the leadership of the Conservative Party, Pierre Poliev, like I said, the main opposition, is really quite radical. And you can think of him kind of as a mini Trump, spewing conspiracy theories and all of these vague and weird insinuations and attacks. And he has publicly affiliated himself with groups that were involved in the Freedom Convoy and all that stuff. You know, this this really radical right-wing stuff. He's always ranting about the elites, even though he is one himself. And that's a whole story in itself. I'm not going to describe that. You can read about it if you want. But that is also kind of alarming because to traditional conservatives, they're like, this is a disaster. The majority of Canadians are just not going to go for this guy. But he has a very strong, rabid MAGA type base that is propelling him to kind of take over this party. It's interesting to note that just like in the United States, the conservative party under their umbrella, they typically include the social conservatives and the evangelical community. The hypocrisy could not be more stark that Christians would align themselves with bald-faced liars. And people who are using intimidation and engaging in thuggish behavior. So there's that happening too. And recently, like in the past week, Canada's Deputy Prime Minister, Krista Freeland, was verbally assaulted, and it was filmed, with obscenities and very aggressive attacks against her, calling her a traitor and all this kind of stuff. And the guy who did it, this occurred in Alberta, which is the most right-wing province in Canada. The guy who did it is a conspiracy theorist. He believes all these, you know, crazy WF right-wing conspiracies and stuff like that. And, you know, most of his beliefs, based on what he has put on social media, are just pure fabrications. They're not even grounded in reality. And there have been other incidents where politicians have been 
verbally assaulted and had things thrown at them and stuff like that, and it's getting out of hand. Quite a few, in fact, have recounted how many serious threats they have received by email and in other ways. In some more typically rural areas, you will see people driving around with F. Trudeau signs on their trucks. And I understand that the same thing happens in the States, except it's F. Biden. Like, people would just have never done stuff like this before. We're polite, generally, and respectful. Very unusual in Canada, really, for the most part. This is just not business as usual. And so for the past while, as I've been watching all this stuff unfold, I've been scratching my head going, like, what is going on? Where are these people coming from? For example, there's a publication in Canada called The Globe and Mail, and I often will check the comments just because uh, you have to be a subscriber to comment so that the comments tend to be generally of higher quality because, you know, just random people can't comment on there. And that's a fairly conservative publication, but still, you know, I'm interested in all these perspectives. If you go into the comments section, you'll see these kind of rabid MAGA types in there constantly. And their angle is really strange because they will often uh, use very Orwellian kind of disinformation techniques where they will flip things around. And like if, if a conservative politician is being questioned, they will flip it around and make it look like it's actually the prime minister's fault and stuff like that. And you're like, what are you, where are you coming from? Like, and you see it repeated over and over and over and over again. And they're always demonizing the prime minister, even though he just recently won an election, Justin Trudeau, that is, as if he's destroying the country and blah, blah, blah. And they're constantly always spewing a lot of these like ridiculous conspiracy theories. Repetition seems to be important to this because they will repeat over and over and over these lies and this misinformation even though other commenters will point out that they are erroneous or factually inaccurate, they just keep repeating them over and over and over again because there's that idea that if you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes truth. This is another very propagandistic or Orwellian technique. And like I said, the whole time I'm kind of like, who are these people? Like, I don't know anybody like that. I don't recognize these types. You know, they, they tend to be more prevalent out west where it's in Saskatchewan and Alberta where it's more conservative. And it's an oil industry-driven economy out there, right? So, you know, they obviously do not want <laughs> climate policies and things like that, which would negatively impact their industry, which is doomed anyway, but that's a whole separate discussion. And other commentators, like uh, people who write columns and stuff, have been talking about this issue of this rising extremism. But nobody has really kind of identified really what's going on, I don't think. And then I also happened to listen today to, to a rebroadcast from the New Yorker Radio Hour podcast, which featured Barbara Walter, a prof from University of California, political scientist, who wrote a book called How Civil Wars Start, so I listened to that again. I'd listened to it when it first came out. And I'm like, yeah, you know, because, you know, sometimes you listen to things twice, you pick up on things that you didn't the first time. And then I was just like, literally, I'm doing the dishes because I stopped and made some food and I was doing the dishes. And it suddenly occurred to me, it just dropped. The penny dropped. I got it. This, what I'm about to say, I think is extremely important because I don't think many people really understand this yet. What is going on, I, it was so clear to me, what is going on is that the right, the extremist right, the far right, they want to sow division and create chaos because as things break down, they will be able to use that as an opportunity to step into the void and offer solutions, which will be radical if not draconian, as you would do under something like a War Measures Act or under a state of emergency, where the executive branch 
would have broad and sweeping powers and be able to bypass many of the democratic checks and balances that would normally constrain them. Now, that might not be a huge concern under the Biden administration, but until recently, the GOP were quite confident that they were going to win in the midterms and probably in 2024 as well. Regardless, they have been playing a very long game. The Powell Memo, which I have talked about before, was written in the early 1970s. So most of us have assumed that, oh, that everyone's just being stupid by subscribing to these conspiracy theories and stuff like that. And clearly there's a lot of people out there who are not very well educated, who don't read or don't read from reputable sources or are subject to conspiracy theories and whatnot. And then there's probably a lot of people who are just not very smart because most of these conspiracy theories are transparently ridiculous. Like if you think about them for more than three minutes, that is not really the point. It's not about the conspiracy theories. It's about creating tension to the point where things break. There will be some form of violence and that violence will create an opportunity for the right to say, see, we told you so, the country is going down the tubes. We need to get out there and fight. They're, in other words, they're trying to provoke an extreme reaction so they can justify their extreme policies. It would take extreme circumstances in order to get away with overruling decades of precedents, legal jurisprudence, tradition, and a reality that people are familiar with. So in order to do that, you have to create really extreme circumstances. It's not accidental. This is very deliberate what they're doing. They're deliberately going on and commenting on all these articles and stuff like that to sow division. Like, for example, here in Canada, they're constantly saying, you know, Trudeau is destroying the country. Well, the Canadian government just had a very healthy surplus. The country is literally not going down the tubes. On the contrary, you know, we have weathered through this pandemic and all that other stuff. They are painting, for example, the response to COVID, like the vaccinations and the health protocols and all that stuff. They are twisting that around and making it look like it's some form of totalitarianism. They literally want to provoke an uprising and probably things like civil war. It's very intentional. The people who are doing this know exactly what they're doing. Many of the so-called foot soldiers don't realize this. They're just pawns. But the people behind this, whether they're domestic or foreign, are literally trying to destabilize the country. I'm sure this is exactly what's happening in the United States. It's the same playbook. In fact, when I was really involved in climate stuff, I noticed very clearly that there was patterns between like Canada, the UK, Australia, United States. One country would try and do something a bit odd or strange to limit action on climate change. And then that would sort of establish a model that then you would see pop up in Canada or the UK, or it tended to shift around. Like to me, it seemed like they were communicating with each other and sharing strategies. And why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they coordinate and cooperate? They have the same agenda. They have the same vested interests behind them. These companies are international. It just makes sense. The Coke empire has a huge stake in the Canadian tar sands in Alberta. This is a very deliberate effort. It's not accidental. And all of the craziness is the symptom. So I'm titling this episode, The Medium is the Message, because that's what came to me. All this craziness is deliberately being deployed and amplified to create circumstances which will break democracy. It's deliberate. Now, who's doing it? Like I said, whether it's domestic or foreign, I'm not 100% sure. I have my suspicions. But they are literally trying to radicalize 
large numbers of people so that they can break the system and then step in with radical solutions. As far as they're concerned, ideally there would literally be street combat because that would provide perfect cover for them to come in and impose their worldview on everybody else because they would have a justification for doing so. Some of you may be familiar with Naomi Klein's book called The Shock Doctrine. Came out a number of years ago, a fellow Canadian, by the way, and it described how in events of a crisis, say there's a big, uh, you know, hurricane hits New York State, Corporations will seize on that opportunity of disarray to come in and capitalize on that situation and take advantage of the disarray and the confusion to implement strategies and policies that under normal circumstances would not be acceptable. And she demonstrated how they've done this over and over and over again. What I think has happened is that the far right has taken that same principle and applied it to social change. And you know who keeps coming to my mind as I'm recording this is Steve Bannon. Chills. This has got his moniker all over it. And all of these right-wing groups are connected through social media and various platforms, so they share their strategies. So what we're seeing starting to happen now in Canada with this radicalization and this extremism the conspiracy theories, the whole MAGA-type movement is creeping into Canadian society. It's only a portion of the population. But you only need to radicalize a small portion of the population in order to create chaos, which potentially can provoke a response and then it snowballs. According to Professor Walter, that's exactly what happens. That's how most civil wars start. I sense that January 6th was like a trial run. The January 6th insurrection was an experiment. They didn't really care too much whether it failed or succeeded. They just wanted to see what would happen and how it would play out. Obviously, they probably would have preferred it if it had been 100% effective. They came pretty darn close if it wasn't for Mike Pence. Who knows how things could have worked out. So this whole strategy is, again, deliberate. And this is the point that I think we haven't widely caught on to yet. My sense is, intuitively, that there are people further up the food chain who are really behind this, who are financing it. And it's probably the oligarchs, or the plutocrats, whatever you want to call them, the really rich people who believe in almost like a monarchy where you have someone in power who they can manipulate, who can implement whatever policies they want, and it's not really truly democratic. And so this whole process is about destabilizing and undermining democracy so that they can implement their policies, which under normal circumstances would never even remotely be considered or would just be flat out rejected. So they came up with a strategy to basically undermine democracy to the point where it would effectively fail and then it would be easier for them to implement their highly unpopular rule. Now, I'm not sure how conscious people are about this in the political spheres. We certainly have one politician here in Canada who is, well, no, two actually, because there's another party called the People's Party. It's much, much, much smaller. but they are similarly radical and conspiracy theory oriented. All this conspiracy theory stuff, I'm always like, how can people believe this crap? And where is it coming from? And, you know, what purpose does it serve? I've just explained it. This is purely intentional. All this chaos, this anarchy, this social division was deliberately engineered. Do the intelligence agencies know this stuff? I bet they do. We need to start looking at it from that perspective. That all of the craziness, the MAGA stuff, the conspiracy theories, 
the extreme polarization and the increasing polarization is being deliberately manufactured to break liberal democracy. It's quite alarming. We need to approach this differently than the way we have been. Because what everybody's been doing is reporting on the symptoms. You know, this conspiracy theory, that conspiracy theory, this politician said that, that politician said that, this politician did this crazy thing, etc. They're missing the point. The chaos is the message. The medium is the message. It's been in front of our faces the whole time. It's kind of alarming to think that much of the chaos, the division and confusion and harm that's being done to people, you know, radicalized people can do crazy things, that it's a deliberate plot to topple liberal democracy and impose some kind of fascistic or semi-fascistic form of rule. Probably because these people in power recognize that their privileged state and the status quo is coming to an end or is under threat. And so the racism and a lot of those kinds of things that are associated with this typically are probably uh, not the core issue. That's probably just something that is being used to radicalize people to achieve this agenda. It's being harnessed and amplified. Now, how far other foreign actors are involved in this? I'm sure they are, but I actually believe that the real threat is coming from within. It's people in the States, primarily, who are really driving this, doing all the groundwork and the legwork. They're the ones who are undermining democracy to the point where people are losing faith in the institutions of law and electoral systems and uh, the economy and all that stuff, right? And public health and education, that is being done from inside. That's an inside job. Now, from my perspective, I perceive this as a new form of warfare. If it's conceivable or even possible that the world's most powerful democracy, the United States of America, could be directly threatened or undermined by these very subversive psychological warfare tactics, or what are known as psyops. And if this can be done from within, from citizens of that very country itself, this is something that desperately needs to be addressed. These people need to be rooted out and held accountable for their treason or sedition. And I believe that even if they didn't succeed or don't succeed this time around, they will continue to refine and perfect their methods and techniques. And the next time, we might not be as lucky. So I, I just intuitively, like I'm getting strong energy here. <laughs> Very strong energy. We cannot simply ignore this. These people have to be held accountable, whoever they are, and we have to get right to the root of it, whether it's these very rich people who want to install some kind of oligarchic, fascistic system because they don't like having to abide by other people's rules, you know, whether it's taxation or environmental regulations or social regulations, or they just hate the idea that people should be able to express their freedoms and liberties in ways that they don't like for ideological reasons or whatever. You know, there's people like Peter Thiel who have pretty much openly talked about how he despises the system that we have currently. These people basically believe that 
most of the population are just idiots, and they don't really care about them. So this could not be more serious. It seems to me that what they've done is taken techniques from Germany in the 1930s, and they have refined and continued to weaponize those. So these weapons of disinformation and manipulation clearly, if we look at January 6th, we can conclude that these weapons are extremely dangerous and extremely powerful, and they have to be curtailed. It's that simple. In effect, these people were trying to foment civil war. And that is not hyperbole, because there are many people on the right who have openly been talking about that. It's not hidden. It's out there. Most people immediately think of the first American Civil War when they think about Civil War. But that's not actually how modern Civil Wars take place. It's much more of an insurgency. It's much more like guerrilla warfare with strategic attacks and very non-hierarchical forces so that if one group is taken out, it doesn't affect the whole campaign. It's completely different. It's not like there's going to be cannons and stuff and the military. That's not how modern civil wars really take place. Think Bosnia, Kosovo, the Middle East, Afghanistan. I mean, the Russians and the Americans and the Allies couldn't put down the Afghans even after vast amounts of time and effort and money and lives, it raged on until they gave up. Anyway, back to my discussion of the agenda of the far right. It's also been very well documented as to their plans for installing an autocratic regime. None of this is in the shadows. Now, most people have thought, well, these people are really on the fringe. What I'm saying is that they are using the masses to do the work for them by inciting them, riling them up, radicalizing them, weaponizing them, and organizing them through online platforms and in real life. It's extremely serious. The people at the top of course, are going to try and stay in the shadows and never be directly linked to this. And the people organizing it and strategizing it at a high level are also probably going to avoid being associated with it as well because they're smart. They will delegate their plans and their authority to avoid accountability. So who knows who is really behind all this stuff. Who's financing it? Who are the brilliant strategists and who comes up with the talking points? The usual suspects come to mind, the Koch brothers, well, Charles now, Leonard Leo, the Federalist Society, the Mercers, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, Eric Prince, Peter Thiel, religious groups and organizations, dark money groups. I could go on and on. And there's probably ones we're just not aware of. Many episodes ago, I did one on the Powell memo. And what I see is that they just keep pushing the boundaries and keep pushing the boundaries. You know, it gets a little bit worse incrementally, year after year. So we can anticipate that they're just going to keep getting more extreme unless they are kept in check somehow. They keep floating trial balloons and then refining and revising their strategy based on what happens or doesn't happen. Now, we're just not generally familiar with what's happening, so to some extent it's kind of outside of our preconceived ideas about what's possible. But if you piece it all together, I think it's pretty clear that this is exactly what's happening. On a higher dimension, I think we can go back to this whole thing I've been discussing recently, which started with the episode I did titled In 
end-to-end accountability now. And then I did a longer episode talking about how we're afraid to use our power. And I guess I'm trying to point out here that the stakes couldn't be higher, both for society and for the biosphere of the planet. Whoa. (laughs) I'm getting strong chills here. The kind of stuff I'm describing here fits in perfectly with the whole theme of Pluto transiting Capricorn. And I did a whole video on Pluto transiting Aquarius, the following sign. And when Pluto moves into Aquarius, starting in March of 2023, we're moving into an energy that's much more about social responsibility and accountability. So the kinds of things I'm describing here do not fit in with that kind of energy that we're going to be experiencing. And I sense that a lot of the people who have profited and benefited from the status quo, perhaps on some deep level, they, they sense or feel this shift of energy that is looming and that a lot of this more radical and dramatic and kind of desperate deployment of tactics may relate to that. That area is coming to an end, and their privilege is really on the line. Especially if people have acted irresponsibly or tremendously selfishly. The 11th house, which is where Aquarius resides, is opposite the 5th house. And the 5th house would be, in its lower expression, would be the most ego-oriented or self-centered or narcissistic energies. Anyway, see the whole episode I did titled Pluto in Aquarius, Dawn of Global Consciousness. Aquarius would be the antithesis of libertarianism. I personally find the libertarian philosophy to be one of the most annoying and gross philosophies out there. It's basically saying that you have no responsibility for anything other than your own self-gratification. It's incredibly selfish and immature. Like, I find all this stuff extremely immature. It's like petulant children. Greedy, selfish, narcissistic, petulant children. The solution is simple. These bad actors need to be held accountable, and you have to get dark money out of politics. For years in all my reading, The person I probably admired the most was Chris Hedges. He came from a religious background. And his... (laughs) Whoa. And he was extremely critical of the status quo. And one of the most brilliant communicators and thinkers that I can think of. I mention that because <laughs> I mention that because I just keep getting this this energy. I mention that because we need truth tellers. Whether or not they make people feel comfortable is kind of besides the point. And there are very few of them, really, of consequence these days. I haven't decided yet, but I may put some supporting links in the description. Still not sure. And of course, this is all for entertainment purposes only. If you find this useful or insightful, please share links to this episode because it really helps as a content creator. You know, we put a lot of time and energy into producing this kind of content and purchasing all the gear and equipment to be able to do it. So it's very helpful to receive credit for this kind of work. I literally haven't made a dime from this. So thanks for everything. Thanks for listening to this. I kind of feel like uh, I'm saying some things that make people uncomfortable, but from my perspective, they're very true. And I also have a track record of being a little bit ahead of my time, so maybe this is something that will take a while for people to fully understand or appreciate. 
Thanks for listening. Thanks for liking, sharing, uh, giving credit where due. And I look forward to talking to you again soon.